Imagine you're a 12 year old child being awakened before dawn by the screams of gunshots and premature death. Leaving for school in the morning, greeted by yellow tape, white chalk, and the smell of gunpowder while fighting to maintain your balance. Slipping on shells of ammunition and empty crack cocaine vials. On your journey to school, you see blood caked into the concrete from someone's soul having bled from their corpse just a few hours earlier. You look in every direction of your village and see nothing but the reality of death, despair, and the curse of intergenerational illiteracy and poverty all denying you the audacity to hope for anything better. You're mere blocks away from the US Capitol, US Supreme Court, and the White House. This was my village, the village that raised me in the nation's capital in the 1980s and 90s. A time when First Lady Hillary Clinton published a book titled, It Takes a Village. After the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And First Lady Nancy Reagan was telling children to just say no. But my village, it never afforded me a choice. My village didn't teach me no. My village, it only showed me yes. In the early 1990s, a professor at Princeton University wrote a report that labeled me and other teenage black boys as super predators. Godless, fatherless, and jobless. His assertion was supported by lawmakers who changed policy to make it easier to try children as adults in the criminal injustice system and to sentence them in prison for the remainder of their lives. On January 21st, 1997, one of those cold gunpowder mornings, I was charged with being an accomplice to a murder. At trial, the alleged shooter had all of the charges dismissed against him. But yet I was convicted, a super predator in the flesh, and sentenced under the accomplice liability doctrine to two indeterminate life sentences. We were just kids, yet the village failed to raise us. Instead of pouring love into us, they just threw us into cages. But see, greatness was always within us, even before the life sentence. We were just under 18, yet everyone forgot that we were just human beings. Super predators became our label. That we were children became a fable, converted us into juvenile lifers. But look at what just three years did to Khalif Browder on Rikers. Yet we served decades and still remain whole with the power of love igniting our soul. We just wanted society to accept us with open arms, give us a second chance to bring love and not harm. From lockdown to Georgetown, we just needed someone to believe that justice also encompasses mercy and redemption is possible for all to achieve. At 16, I'd become a character in the dehumanizing narrative 
labeling children whose village never gave them a chance, whose leaders punished the children instead of the village. A contrived and misguided story told over and over again that led to me being convicted of a murder that I did not commit. But that story there, see, that would end with me. My teenage years in confinement begged a new question. If it takes a village to raise a child, what happens when the village fails? Are we to punish the innocent child for actualizing the intergenerational realities of poverty, illiteracy, drug and alcohol abuse, and gun violence? Or will we also hold accountable the caretakers of the village for failing to create and sustain a more loving and healthy environment for its children? I will cry for the little boy in shackles and away from home. I will cry for the little boy trapped in a cell all alone. I will cry for the little boy whose heart is too cold to weep. See, I will cry for that little boy whose pain never lets him sleep. I will cry for the little boy. He was buried alive in the burning sand. I will cry for the little boy sentenced to life like a man. I will cry for the little boy who knows that his soul is in chains. I will cry for that little boy. His spirit died again and again. I will cry for the little boy, a good boy he tried to be. I will cry for that little boy that died inside of me. I published 11 books during my 22 years of incarceration. Words were my only freedom. Inside of my cage, I discovered that children are merely a reflection of the adults that they see. If they are loving human beings, then it's because of a nurturing village that invested love and care into their development. If children are the monsters, super predators, and menaces society labeled them to be, then they can only be a reflection of the village that failed to create a healthy and humane environment for them to develop into productive members of our collective society. I am a super predator, the child that we cast away, flushed down the school to prison pipeline for decades in a cage to lay. See, my soul strolls the Confederate's river. What I cannot call master, mister. Strange fruit vulture picked from the Linton tree. What soul would dare compose a song for me? See, I am nothing but a menace to society with no big will for God's grace to carry me to a place where my foot won't slip beneath the sand to drown as a man child in this promised land. So my soul would decompose in a cage for 22 years, made in the veneer of America's fears. Who will fight for the child that the village failed to raise with no audacity to hope for better days? Is it possible for a child to transcend the confines of their environment? Of course, but it is not the child's responsibility to create a loving village 
to nurture them into healthy adults. If children are not responsible enough to vote, to serve on a jury, or to hold political office, then it is not fair to expect them to exercise the maturity to overcome the inter intergenerational barriers within their homes, communities, and our society. See, I believe in the transformative power of love, radical love for self, for those who love you, and even those who may hate you. In my decades of confinement, it was the transformative powers of literature and the arts, along with revolutionary love, that gifted me the audacity to hope that I can be more than a super predator that my village labeled me to be. I'm not going to write poems about people judging people. See, I'm going to write poems and speak about people loving people. Because the problem is much bigger than just class and race. See, it's not a political war, but a spiritual battle between love and hate. If it's going to take a village, then our villages are going to need love. So when they see us, they don't see us as killers and thugs. So when they see us, they see us and don't judge. So when they see us, they see us with eyes full of love. It's not about conservatives and liberals reaching across the aisle. It's about reaching into our hearts to extend a loving smile. See, these labels are fables that separate us from our truths. We all need to weed the weeds to see the love in our roots. Love is the revolution, and compassion be our bullets. Empathy is the trigger for forgiveness to pull it. Freedom is our target, and unconditional love be our goal. With civic engagement starting at the seat of our soul, grace plays the symphony as just mercy leads the band for the lady of liberty to love and accept all in this land. The coronavirus pandemic taught us all how it feels to be isolated and away from the people, places, and things that we love the most. We've learned what it feels like to live in fear of the shadow of death waiting for us on our doorsteps. And we've experienced how deeply interconnected we all really are. Regardless of the superficial barriers of race, gender, and class. And perhaps in being denied the physical touch, we have became aware of just how critical to our joy and happiness and our survival that it is to be able to just have the opportunity to reach out to another with love. What does the revitalization of love look like in our State of the Union today? Lady Liberty puts out a call to the world. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Why do we stifle living breath when she promises hope? Why do we choke the call for justice when she promises all equality? Why do we end a life when all any of us want to do is breathe? The village fails when it does not love. 
We fail when we do not love ourselves. When we fail to love ourselves, it is impossible for us to love others. When we fail to love our children, we forsake our own future. I believe in the transformative power of love. Thank you.